Hello everyone, and welcome once again to Soft Stories. I'm Stratton, and it's such a pleasure to have you here with me today. If you've watched some of the other episodes of this series on Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson, this lovely little book that I have here that we have been reading for the past ten hours almost, you might notice that the perspective of this video is very different than my previous ones, and the reason for that is that I've been thinking a lot about perspective and about what the perspective of these videos means in terms of you, the viewer, and how I can connect more with you. When I started these, I wanted you all to see what I see when I look at these books, of which Treasure Island is, I hope, the first of many. What you see when I am reading, when we, then, are reading these books together. But I spoke with some people who I have a very high opinion of, and they expressed their concerns about it feeling a little impersonal, and that's the opposite of what I want. So today is going to be a little bit of an experiment. In this next episode of Treasure Island, we are going to be reading face to face. And this particular book um, this copy of Treasure Island does not have any plates or drawings in it. So, other than the unique imperfections in this copy, which make it so special to me, uh, there's not much in the text that you'll be missing. So let me know what you think about reading it this way, and if I can get a little bit of feedback, we will adjust from there. This is very much a learning experience for me, and I want to make videos and do readings with you that I am happy with, and that all of you enjoy as well. So as we walk that path towards being the best that we can be together, let us dive back in to Treasure Island. So when last we left Jim Hawkins, he was on a bit of an adventure. He had left behind the stockade and its relative safety after the embassy of that old buccaneer, the one-legged man, Long John Silver, and had decided to take Ben Gunn's little coracle and take it out to sea to the Hispaniola that is docked in the harbour at Skeleton Island and he planned to cut it loose of its mooring, of its anchorage and let it drift ashore to stop the pirates from getting away and to lower their morale. It's a brave choice but a dangerous one 
And so I guess we'll have to see what the result of that escapade is now. So here we are. Chapter 24. The Cruise of the Coracle. It was broad a day when I awoke and found myself tossing at the southwest end of Treasure Island. The sun was up, but was still hid from me behind the great bulk of the spyglass, which on this side descended almost to the sea in formidable cliffs. Hall bowline head and mizzen mast hill were at my elbow. The hill bare and dark, the head bound with cliffs forty or fifty feet high and fringed with great masses of fallen rock. I was scarce a quarter of a mile to seaward, and it was my first thought to paddle in and land. That notion was soon given over. Among the fallen rocks the breakers spouted and bellowed. Loud reverberations, heavy sprays flying and falling, succeeded one another from second to second. And I saw myself if I ventured nearer, dashed to death upon the rough shore, or spending my strength in vain to scale the beetling crags. Nor was that all, for crawling together on flat tables of rock, or letting themselves drop into the sea with loud reports, I beheld huge, slimy monsters, soft snails, as it were, of incredible bigness, two or three score of them together, making the rocks to echo with their barkings. I have understood since that they were sea lions, and entirely harmless. But the look of them, added to the difficulty of the shore, and the high running of the surf was more than enough to disgust me of that landing place. I felt willing, rather, to starve at sea than to confront such perils. In the meantime, I had a better chance, as I supposed, before me. North of Hall Bowline Head, the land runs in a long way, leaving, at low tide, a long stretch of yellow sand. To the north of that, again, there comes another cape, cape of the woods as it was marked upon the chart, buried in tall green pines which descended to the margin of the sea. I remembered what Silver had said about the current that sets northward along the whole west coast of Treasure Island, and seeing from my position that I was already under its influence, I preferred to leave Hall Bowline Head behind me and reserve my strength for an attempt to land upon the kindlier-looking Cape of the Woods. There was a great, smooth swell upon the sea, the wind blowing steady and gentle from the south. There was no contrariety between that and the current, and the billows rose and fell unbroken. Had it been otherwise, I must long ago have perished, but as it was, it is surprising how easy and securely my little and light boat could ride. 
Often, as I lay still at the bottom, and kept no more than an eye above the gunwale, I would see a big blue summit heaving close above me. Yet the coracle would but bounce a little, dance as if on springs, and subside on the other side into the trough as lightly as a bird. I began, after a little, to grow very bold, and sat up to try my skill at paddling. But even a small change in the disposition of the weight will produce violent changes in the behaviour of a coracle. And I had hardly moved before the boat, giving up at once her gentle dancing movement ran straight down a slope of water so steep that it made me giddy, and struck her nose with a spout of spray deep into the side of the next wave. I was drenched and terrified, and instantly fell back into my old position, whereupon the coracle seemed to find her head again and led me as softly as before among the billows. It was plain she was not to be interfered with, and at that rate, since I could in no way influence her course, what hope had I left of reaching land? I began to be horribly frightened, but I kept my head for all that. First, moving with all care, I gradually bailed out the coracle with my sea cup. Then, getting my eye once more above the gunwale, I set myself to study how it was she managed to slip so quietly through the rollers. I found each wave, instead of the big, smooth, glossy mountain it looks from the shore, or from a vessel's deck, was for all the world like any range of hills on the dry land, full of peaks and smooth places and valleys. The coracle left to herself, turning from side to side, threaded, so to speak, her way through these lower parts, and avoided the steep slopes and higher toppling summits of the wave. Well now, thought I to myself, it is plain I must lie where I am, and not disturb the balance, but it is plain also that I can put paddle over the side and, from time to time, in smooth places, give her a shove or two towards land. No sooner thought upon than done. There I lay on my elbows, in the most trying attitude, and every now and again gave a weak stroke or two to turn her head to shore. It was very tiring and slow work, yet I did visibly gain ground, and as we drew near the cape of the woods, Though I saw I must infallibly miss that point, I had still made some hundred yards of easting. I was, indeed, close in. I could see the cool green treetops swaying together in the breeze, and I felt sure I should make the next promontory without fail. It was high time, for I now began to be tortured with thirst. The glow of the sun from above, its thousandfold reflection from the waves, the sea water that fell and dried upon me, caking my very lips with salt, combined to make my throat burn and my brain ache. The sight of the trees so near at hand had almost made me sick with longing, 
but the current had soon carried me past the point, and, as the next reach of sea opened out, I beheld a sight that changed the nature of my thoughts. Right in front of me, not half a mile away, I beheld the Hispaniola under sail. I made sure, of course, that I should be taken, but I was so distressed for want of water that I scarce knew whether to be glad or sorry at the thought. And long before I had come to a conclusion, surprise had taken entire possession of my mind, and I could do nothing but stare and wonder. The Hispaniola was under her mainsail, and two jibs, and the beautiful white canvas shone in the sun like snow or silver. When I first sighted her, all her sails were drawing. She was lying a course about northwest, and I presumed the men on board were going round the island on their way back to the anchorage. Presently, she began to fetch more and more to the westward, so that I thought they had sighted me and were going about in chase. At last, however, she fell right into the wind's eye, was taken dead aback, and stood there a while, helpless, her sails shivering. Clumsy fellows, said I, they must still be drunk as owls. And I thought how Captain Smollett would have set them skipping. Meanwhile, the schooner gradually fell off and filled again upon another tack, sailed swiftly for a minute or so, and brought up once more dead in the wind's eye. Again and again this was repeated, to and fro, up and down, north, south, east and west, the Hispaniola sailed by swoops and dashes, and at each repetition ended as she had begun, idly flapping canvas. It became plain to me that no one was steering, and, if so, where were the men? Either they were dead drunk, or had deserted her, I thought, and perhaps, if I could get on board, I might return the vessel to her captain. The current was bearing coracle and schooner southward at an equal rate. As for the latter's sailing, it was so wild and intermittent, and she hung each time so long in irons, that she certainly gained nothing if she did not even lose. If only I dared to sit up and paddle, I made sure that I could overhaul her. The scheme had an air of adventure that inspired me, and the thought of the water-breaker beside the four companion doubled my growing courage. Up I got, was welcomed almost instantly by another cloud of spray, but this time stuck to my purpose, and set myself, with all my strength and caution, to paddle after the unsteered Hispaniola, once I shipped a sea so heavy that I had to stop and bail, with my heart fluttering like a bird. But gradually I got into the way of the thing, and guided my coracle among the waves, with only now and then a blow upon her bows and a dash of foam in my face. I was now gaining rapidly on the schooner, I could see the brass glisten on the tiller as it banked about, and still no soul appeared upon her decks. 
I could not choose but suppose she was deserted. If not, the men were lying drunk below, where I might batten them down, perhaps, and do what I chose with the ship. For some time she had been doing the worst thing possible for me, standing still. She headed nearly due south, yawing, of course, all the time. Each time she fell off her sails partly filled, and these brought her, in a moment, right into the wind again. I have said this was the worst thing possible for me, for... Helpless as she looked in this situation, with the canvas cracking like cannon, and the blocks trundling and banging on the deck, she still continued to run away from me, not only with the speed of the current, but by the whole amount of her leeway, which was naturally great. But now, at last, I had my chance. The breeze fell, for some seconds very low, and the current gradually turning her, the Hispaniola revolved slowly around her centre, and at last presented me her stern, with the cabin window still gaping open, and the lamp over the table still burning on into the day. The mainsail hung drooped like a banner, she was stock still but for the current. For the last little while I had even lost, but now, redoubling my efforts, I began once more to overhaul the chase. I was not a hundred yards from her when the wind came again in a clap. She filled on the port tack and was off again, stooping and skimming like a swallow. My first impulse was one of despair, but my second was towards joy. Round she came till she was broadside on to me, round still till she had covered a half, and then two-thirds, and then three-quarters of the distance that separated us. I could see the waves boiling white under her forefoot. Immensely tall she looked to me from my low station in the coracle. And then, suddenly, I began to comprehend. I had scarce time to think, scarce time to act and save myself. I was on the summit of one swell when the schooner came stooping over the next. The bowsprit was over my head. I sprang to my feet and leaped stamping the coracle under water. With one hand I caught the jib-boom, while my foot was still lodged between the stay and the brace. As I still clung, panting, a dull blow told me that the schooner had charged down upon and struck the coracle, and that I was left, without retreat, on the Hispaniola. exciting, and a shame that poor Ben Cunn has built this lovely little coracle, which I guess must be analogous to a kayak. I am not exactly up on my nautical terminology, uh, but the fact that it is so sadly destroyed is tragic in a sense, after I'm sure it was the source of so much hope for him. But now, I suppose, that hope springs anew with the return of the Hispaniola to the hands of the loyal crew. But let's see what happens next. In chapter 25, I strike the Jolly Roger. I had scarce gained a position on the bowsprit when the flying jib flapped and filled upon another tack with a report like a gun. The schooner trembled to her keel under the reverse, but next moment, the other sails still drawing, the jib flapped back again and hung 
idol. This had nearly tossed me off into the sea, and now I lost no time, crawled back along the bowsprit, and tumbled head foremost on the deck. I was on the lee side of the forecastle, and the mainsail, which was still drawing, concealed from me a certain portion of the after-deck. Not a soul was to be seen. The planks, which had not been swabbed since the mutiny, bore the print of many feet, and an empty bottle, broken by the neck, tumbled to and fro like a live thing in the scuppers. Suddenly the Hispaniola came right into the wind, the jibs behind me cracked aloud, the rudder slammed to, the whole ship gave a sickening heave and shudder, and at the same moment the main boom swung inboard, the sheet groaning in the blocks, and showed me the lee after deck. There were two watchmen, sure enough. Redcap on his back, as stiff as a handspike, with his arms stretched out like those of a crucifix, and his teeth showing through his open lips. Israel hands propped against the bulwarks, his chin on his chest, his hands lying open before him on the deck, his face as white under its tan as a tallow candle. For a while, the ship kept bucking and sidling like a vicious horse, the sails filling now on one tack, now on another, and the boom swinging to and fro till the mast groaned aloud under the strain. Now and again, too, there would come a cloud of light sprays over the bulwark, and a heavy blow of the ship's bows against the swell. So much heavier weather was made of it by this great rigged ship than by my home-made lopsided coracle, now gone to the bottom of the sea. At every jump of the schooner, Redcap slipped to and fro, but what was ghastly to behold, neither his attitude nor his fixed teeth disclosing grin was any way disturbed by this rough usage. At every jump, too, hands appeared still more to sink into himself and settle down upon the deck his feet sliding ever the farther out, and the whole body canting towards the stern, so that his face became, little by little, hidden from me. And at last I could see nothing beyond his ear and the frayed ringlet of one whisker. At the same time I observed around both of them splashes of dark blood upon the planks, and began to feel sure that they had killed each other in their drunken wrath. While I was thus looking and wondering in a calm moment when the ship was still, Israel hands turned partly round, and with a low moan writhed himself back to the position in which I had seen him first. The moan, which told of pain and deadly weakness, and the way in which his jaw hung open, went right to my heart. But when I remembered the talk I had overheard from the apple barrel, all pity left me. I walked aft until I reached the mainmast. Come aboard, Mr. Hands, I said ironically. He rolled his eyes around heavily, 
but he was too far gone to express surprise. All he could do was utter one word. Brandy. It occurred to me that there was no time to lose, and, dodging the boom as it once more lurched across the deck, I slipped aft and down the companion stairs into the cabin. It was such a scene of confusion as you can hardly fancy. All the lockfast places had been broken open in quest of the chart. The floor was thick with mud where the ruffians had sat down to drink or consult after wading in the marshes round their camp. The bulkheads, all painted in clear white and beaded round with gilt, bore a pattern of dirty hands. Dozens of empty bottles clinked together in the corners to the rolling of the ship. One of the doctor's medical books lay open on the table, half of the leaves gutted out, I suppose, for pipe lights. In the midst of all this, the lamp still cast a smoky glow, obscure and brown as umber. I went into the cellar. All the barrels were gone, and of the bottles a most surprising number had been drunk out and thrown away. Certainly, since the mutiny began, not a man of them could ever have been sober. Foraging about, I found a bottle with some brandy left for hands, and for myself I routed out some biscuit, some pickled fruits, a great bunch of raisins, and a piece of cheese. With these I came on deck, put down my own stock behind the rudder head, and well out of the coxswain's reach, went forward to the water-breaker, and had a good, deep drink of water. And then, and not until then, gave hands the brandy. He must have drunk a gill before he took the bottle from his mouth. Ay, said he, by thunder, but I wanted some of that. I had sat down already in my own corner and begun to eat. Much hurt? I asked him. He grunted, or rather, I may say, he barked. If that doctor was aboard, he said, I'd be right enough in a couple of turns. But I don't have no manner of luck, you see. And that's what's the matter with me. As for that swab, he's as good as dead. He is, he added, indicating the man with the red cap. He weren't no seaman anyhow. And where might you have come from? Well, said I, I've come aboard to take possession of this ship, Mr. Hands, and you'll please regard me as your captain until further notice. He looked at me sourly enough, but said nothing. Some of the colour had come back into his cheeks, though he still looked very sick, and still continued to slip out and settle down as the ship banged about. "'By the by,' I continued, "'I can't have these colours, Mr. Hands, "'and by your leave I'll strike them. "'Better none than these.' "'And again, dodging the boom, "'I ran to the colour lines, "'hauled down their cursed black flag, "'and chucked it overboard. "'God save the king,' said I, "'waving my cap. "'And there's an end to Captain Silver.' He watched me, keenly and slyly, his chin all the while on his breast. I reckon, he said at last, I reckon, Captain Hawkins, you'll, know, you'll kind of want to get ashore now. Suppose we talks. Why, yes 
says I. With all my heart, Mr. Hans, say on. And I went back to my meal with a good appetite. This man, he began, nodding feebly at the corpse. O'Brien were his name, a rank islander. But this man and me got the canvas on her, meaning for to sail her back. Well, he is dead now, he is, as dead as bilge. And who's to sail this ship? I don't see. Without I gives you a hint, you ain't that man, as far as I can tell. No. Look here. You gives me food and drink. And an old scarf or anchor to tie my wound up. You do? And I'll tell you how to sail her. And that's about square all round, I take it. I'll tell you one thing, says I. I'm not going back to Captain Kidd's anchorage. I mean to get into North Inlet and breach her quietly there. To be sure you're dead, he cried. Why, I ain't such an infernal lubber after all. I can see, can't I? I've tried my fling, I have, and I've lost. And it's you as the wind of me. North Inlet? Why... I have no choice, not I. I'd help you sail her up to execution dock by thunder. So I would. Well, as seemed to me, there was some sense in this. We struck our bargain on the spot. In three minutes I had the Hispaniola sailing easily before the wind along the coast of Treasure Island. With good hopes of turning the northern point ere noon, and beating down again as far as North Inlet before high water, when we might beach her safely, and wait till the subsiding tide permitted us to land. Then I lashed the tiller and went below to my own chest, where I got a soft silk handkerchief of my mother's. With this, and with my aid, Hands bound up the great bleeding stab he had received in the thigh, and after he had eaten a little, and had a swallow or two more of the brandy, he began to pick up visibly, sat straighter up, spoke louder and clearer, and looked in every way another man. The breeze served us admirably. We skimmed before it like a bird, the coast of the island flashing by, the view changing every minute. Soon we were past the highlands and bowling beside the low, sandy country, sparsely dotted with dwarf pines, and soon we were beyond that again, and had turned the corner of the rocky hill that ends the island on the north. I was greatly elated with my new command, and pleased with the bright, sunshiny weather, and these different prospects on the coast. I had now plenty of water and good things to eat, and my conscience, which had smitten me hard for my desertion, was quieted by the great conquest I made. I should, I think have had nothing left me to desire but for the eyes of the coxswain, as they followed me derisively about the deck, and the odd smile that appeared continuously on his face. It was a smile that had in it something both of pain and weakness, a haggard old man's smile. But there was besides that, a grain of derision, a shadow of treachery in his expression as he craftily watched and watched and watched me at my work. I don't know about you, but I am having a bit of trouble trusting Mr. Israel Hands. 
despite his sudden turn, or maybe because of it. That worked out in one case prior, at the very beginning of the mutiny, but I think Hans is a bit too crafty by half. But let's see. In chapter 26, Israel Hands, I guess we will see. The wind, serving us to a desire, now hauled into the west. We could run so much the easier from the northeast corner of the island to the north of the north inlet. Only, as we had no power to anchor, and I dared not beach her till the tide had flowed a good deal farther, time hung on our hands. The coxswain told me how to lay the ship to. After a good many trials I succeeded, and we both sat in silence over another meal. Come, said he at length, with that same uncomfortable smile. Here's my old shipmate, O'Brien. Suppose you was to heave him overboard. I ain't particular as a rule, and I don't take no blame for settling his hash. But I don't reckon him ornamental, no. Do you? I'm not strong enough, and I don't like the job. And there he lies for me, said I. Ah, this here is an unlucky ship, this Hispaniola, Jim, he went on, blinking. There's a power of men been killed in this Hispaniola. A sight of poor seamen dead and gone since you and me took up ship in Bristol. Never seen such doughty luck, such I... There was this here O'Brien, now he's dead, ain't he? Well now, I'm no scholar, and you're a lad as can read and figure. And to put it straight, do you take it as a dead man is dead for good, or he comes alive again? You can kill the body, Mr. Hans, but not the spirit. You must know that already, I replied. O'Brien, there is in another world and maybe watching us. Ah, says he. Well, that's unfortunate. Appears as if killing parties was a waste of time. Howsomever, spirits don't reckon for much. By what I've seen, I'll chance it with the spirits, Jim. And now you've spoke up free, and I'll take it kind if you'd step down into that there cabin and get me a... Uh, well, uh, shiver my timbers. I can't hit the name on Well, you get me a bottle of wine, Jim. This here brandy is too strong for my head. Now, the coxswain's hesitation seemed to be unnatural. And as for the notion of his preferring wine to brandy... I entirely disbelieved it. The whole story was a pretext. He wanted me to leave the deck. So much was plain. But with what purpose I could in no way imagine. His eyes never met mine. They kept wandering to and fro. Now with a look to the sky... Now, with a flitting glance upon the dead O'Brien, all the time he kept smiling and putting his tongue out in the most guilty, embarrassed manner, so that a child could have told that he was bent on some deception. I was prompt with my answer, however, for I saw where my advantage lay and that with a fellow so densely stupid I could easily conceal my suspicions to the end. Some wine, I said. Far better. Will you have white or red? Well, 
I reckon it's about the blessed seam to me, shipmate, he replied. So it's strong and plenty of it. What's the odds? All right, I answered. I'll bring you port, Mr. Hans, but I'll have to dig for it. With that, I scuttled down the companion with all the noise I could, slipped off my shoes, ran quietly upon the barred gallery, mounted the forecastle ladder, and popped my head out of the fore companion. I knew he would not expect to see me there, yet I took every precaution possible, and certainly the worst of my suspicions proved too true. He had risen from his position to his hands and knees, and though his leg obviously hurt him pretty sharply when he moved, for I could hear him stifle a groan, yet it was a good, rattling rate that he trailed himself across the deck. In half a minute he had reached the port scuppers and picked out, out of a coil of rope, a long knife or rather a short dirk, discoloured to the hilt with blood. He looked upon it for a moment, thrusting forth his underjaw, tried the point upon his hand, and then, hastily concealing it in the bosom of his jacket, trundled back again into his old place against the bulwark. This was all that I required to know. Israel could move about. He was now armed. And if he had been at so much trouble to get rid of me, it was plain that I was meant to be the victim. What he would do afterwards, whether he would try to crawl right across the island from North Inlet to the camp among the swamps, or whether we, he would fire Long Tom, trusting that his own comrades might come first to help him, was, of course, more than I could say. Yet I felt sure that I could trust him on one point, since in that our interests jumped together, and that was in the disposition of the schooner. We both desired to have her stranded safe enough in a sheltered place, and so that, when the time came, she could be got off again with as little labour and danger as might be. And until that was done, I considered that my life would certainly be spared. While I was thus turning my business over in my mind, I had not been idle with my body. I had stolen back to the cabin slipped once more into my shoes, and laid my hand at random on a bottle of wine. And now, with this for an excuse, I made my reappearance on the deck. Hands lay as I had left him, all fallen together in a bundle and with his eyelids lowered, as though he were too weak to bear the light. He looked up, however, at my coming, knocked the neck off the bottle like a man who had done the same thing often, and took a good swig, with his favourite toast of, Here's luck! Then he lay quiet for a while, and then, pulling out a stick of tobacco, begged me to cut him a quid. Cut me a junk of that! says he, for I haven't no knife, and hardly strength enough, so be as I had. Ah, uh, Jim, Jim, I reckon I've missed steez. Cut me a quid, as likely I'll be the last, lad, for I'm for my long home, and no mistake. Hmm. Well, said I, I'll cut you some tobacco. But if I were you, and thought myself so badly, I would go to my prayers, like a Christian man. Why, said he, now, you tell me why. 
Why? I cried. You were just asking me just now about the dead. You've broken your trust. You've lived in sin and lies and blood. There's a man you killed lying at your feet at this moment. And you ask me why? For God's mercy, Mr. Hans, that is why. I spoke with a little heat, thinking of the bloody dirk he had hidden in his pocket, and designed, in his ill thoughts, to end me with. He, for his part, took a great draught of the wine, and spoke with the most unusual solemnity. For thirty years, he said, I've sealed the seas, and seen good and bad, better and worse, fair weather and foul, provisions running out, knives going, and what not. Well, now I tell you, I've never seen good come a goodness yet. Him as strikes first, is my fancy. Dead men don't bite. Them's my views. Amen, so be it. And now, you look here, he added, suddenly changing his tone. You've had about enough of this foolery. The tide's made good enough now. You just take my orders, Captain Hawkins, and we'll sail slap in and be done with it. All told, we had scarce two miles to run, but the navigation was delicate. The entrance to this northern anchorage was not only narrow and shoal, but lay east and west, so that the schooner must be nicely handled to be got in. I think I was a good, prompt subaltern, and I am very sure that Hans was an excellent pilot. For we went about and about, and dodged in, shaving the banks with a certainty and a neatness that were a pleasure to behold. Scarcely had we passed the heads before the land closed around us. The shores of North Inlet were as thickly wooded as those of the southern anchorage, but the space was longer and narrower, and more like what in truth it was, the estuary of a river. Right before us, at the southern end, we saw the wreck of a ship in the last stages of dilapidation. It had been a great vessel of three masts, but had lain so long exposed to the injuries of the weather that it was hung about with great webs of dripping seaweed, and on the deck of it shore bushes had taken root and now flourished thick with flowers. It was a sad sight, but it showed us that the anchorage was calm. No, said Hans, look here. There's a pet bit for us to beach a ship in. Fine flat sand, never a cat's paw, trees all round of it, and flowers are blowing like a guarding on that old ship. And once beached, I inquired, how shall we get her off again? Why so, he replied. You take a line ashore there on the other side at low water. Take a turn about one of them big pines. Bring it back. Take a turn round the capstan and lie to for the tide. Come high water, all hands take a pull upon the line, and off she comes, as sweet as nature. And now, boy, you stand by. We're near the bit now, and she's too much way on her. Starboard a little. So, steady, starboard, larboard a little. Steady, steady. So he issued his commands, which I breathlessly obeyed, till, all of a sudden, he cried, Now, my hearty, luff! And I put the helm hard up, and the Hispaniola swung round rapidly 
and ran stem on for the low wooded shore. The excitement of these last manoeuvres had somewhat interfered with the watch I had kept hitherto, sharply enough, upon the coxswain. Even then, I was still so much interested waiting for the ship to touch that I had quite forgot the peril that hung over my head, and stood craning over the starboard bulwarks and watching the ripples spreading wide before the bows. I might have fallen without a struggle for my life had not a sudden disquietude seized upon me and made me turn my head. Perhaps I heard a creak, or saw his shadow moving with a tail of my eye. Perhaps it was an instinct, like a cat's. But sure enough, when I looked round, there was Hans already halfway towards me, with the dirk in his right hand. We must both have cried aloud when our eyes met, but while mine was the shrill cry of terror... His was a roar of fury, like a charging bull's. At the same instant he threw himself forward, and I leapt sideways towards the bows. As I did so, I left hold of the tiller, which sprang sharp to leeward, and I think this saved my life, for it struck hands across the chest and stopped him, for the moment, dead. Before he could recover, I was safe out of the corner where he had me trapped, with all of the deck to dodge about. Just forward of the mainmast I stopped, drew a pistol from my pocket, took a cool aim, though he had already turned and was once more coming directly after me, and drew the trigger. The hammer fell, but there was neither sound nor flash. The priming was useless with seawater. I cursed myself for my neglect. Why had I not, long before, reprimed and reloaded my only weapons? Then I should not have been, as now, a mere fleeing sheep before this butcher. Wounded as he was, it was wonderful how fast he could move his grizzled hair tumbling over his face, and his face itself as red as a red ensign, with his haste and fury. I had no time to try for my other pistol, nor, indeed, much inclination, for I was sure it would be useless. One thing I saw plainly, I must not simply retreat before him, or he would speedily hold me boxed into the bows, as a moment since he had so nearly boxed me in the stern. Once so caught, and nine or ten inches of the blood-stained dirk would be my last experience on this side of eternity. I placed my palms against the mainmast, which was of a goodish bigness, and waited, every nerve upon the stretch. Seeing that I meant to dodge, he also paused, and a moment or two passed in feints on his part and corresponding movements on mine. It was such a game as I had often played at home about the rocks of Black Hill Cove, but never before, you may be sure, with such a wildly beating heart as now. Still, as I say, it was a boy's game, and I thought I could hold my own at it against an elderly seaman with a wounded thigh. Indeed, my courage had begun to rise so high that I allowed myself a few darting thoughts on what would be the end of the affair, and while I saw, certainly, that I could spin it out for long, I saw no hope of any ultimate escape. Well... While things stood thus, suddenly the Hispaniola struck, staggered, ground for an instant in the sand, and then, swift as a blow, cantered over to the port side, till the deck stood at an angle of forty-five degrees, and about a puncheon of water splashed into the scupper holes, 
and lay in a pool between the deck and bulwark. We were both of us capsized in a second, and both of us rolled almost together into the scuppers. The dead redcap, with his arms still spread out, tumbling stiffly after us. So near were we, indeed, that my head came against the coxswain's foot with a crack that made my teeth rattle. Blow and all, I was the first afoot again, for hands had got involved with the dead body. The sudden canting of the ship had made the deck no place for running on. I had to find some new way of escape. And that upon the instant, for my foe was almost touching me. Quick as thought, I sprang into the mizzen shrouds, rattled up hand over hand, and did not draw a breath till I was seated on the cross trees. I had been saved by being prompt. The dirk had stuck not half a foot below me as I pursued my upward flight. And there stood Israel Hands with his mouth open and his face upturned to mine a perfect statue of surprise and disappointment. Now that I had a moment to myself, I lost no time in changing the priming of my pistol, and then, having one ready for service, and to make assurance doubly sure, I proceeded to draw the load of the other and recharge it afresh from the beginning. My new employment struck hands all of a heap. He began to see the dice going against him. And after an obvious hesitation, he also hauled himself heavily into the shrouds, and with the dirk in his teeth, began slowly and painfully to mount. It cost him no end of time and groans to haul his wounded leg behind him, and I had quietly finished my arrangements before he was much more than a third of the way up. Then, with a pistol in either hand, I addressed him. "'One more step, Mr. Hans,' said I, "'and I'll blow your brains out. "'Dead men don't bite, you know,' I added with a chuckle. He stopped instantly. I could see by the working of his face that he was trying to think, and the process was so slow and laborious that, in my newfound security, I laughed aloud. At last, with a swallow or two, he spoke, his face still wearing the same expression of extreme perplexity. In order to speak, he had to take the dagger from his mouth. But in all else, he remained unmoved. Jim, says he, I reckon we're fouled, you and me, and we'll have to sign articles. I'd have had you but for that there lurch. But I don't have no luck, not I. And I reckon I'll have to strike which comes hard, you see, for a master mariner to a ship's yunker like you, Jim. I was drinking in his words and smiling away, as conceited as a cock upon a wall, when, all in a breath, back went his right hand over his shoulder. Something sang like an arrow through the air. I felt a blow and then a sharp pang, and there I was, pinned by the shoulder to the mast. In horrid pain and surprise of the moment, I scarce can say it was by my own volition, and I'm sure it wasn't without a conscious aim. Both my pistols went off, and both escaped out of my hands. They did not fall alone. With a choked cry, the coxswain loosed his grip upon the shrouds and plunged headfirst into the water. 
And that, I think, at the end of chapter 26, is where we will leave it for today. What an exciting development, and by gosh, an exciting couple of chapters. I am trying very hard to deliver this reading in a measured and careful way, but I just sort of get a bit caught up in what exactly is going on. I am really enjoying reading this book again, and I hope that you are all enjoying going through it with me. It's uh, such a fun little novel. I have plans as to what we will read next for, as you can see, we're drawing near to the end of this book. I think we must have eight chapters to go, something like that. But once this is finished, I hope that the next book that I have planned, uh, which is another book from the 19th century, uh, and another one that I have owned for a while and am very proud of the condition of the copy of, uh, I hope that that will be slightly less action-packed and require a little less exuberance in the reading. But if you enjoy that exuberance, I hope you'll let me know either in the comments section below or in uh, the comments via email, which you can find in the description below this video as well. So please do feel free to get in touch with me. I would very much appreciate any feedback that you might happen to have. This episode has been full of a lot of editorialising from me, and I apologise about that. I hope in future uh, we'll be able to keep it a little bit more on topic, as I'm sure that the reason you're here is not to hear me talk about the process, but to experience the story of Treasure Island with me. So, on that note, for today, I will leave you. But we'll see each other again soon, as we return once again to Treasure Island and continue our adventure with Jim Hawkins. I look forward to it, and I'll see you soon. Goodbye.